Hello, saints, peace, grace, love of Christ Jesus be with all of you. I hope everybody is doing fantastic out there today. Normally, at the beginning of each study, I do a kind of like a review of everything that we've seen so far in the book of Acts. But now that we're almost halfway through our study, reviewing everything takes a lot of time and it takes out of our 30 minute goal for each video. So, what I've decided to do is exactly what you see on the screen now. At the beginning of each study, I'm going to put up a, a short outline of everything that we've done thus far. And if you want to go over all of it, then you can just press pause, read everything, and so on. All right. Now, we're in the beginning. We're in the year of uh, right around 47 to 48 AD. Paul is about to begin his first journey with Barnabas. Approximately 17 years have gone by since our Lord Jesus has been crucified. Uh, about 16 years since the stoning of Israel's prophet Stephen in 31 AD. And it's been about 14 years since our Apostle Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus. Now the question that we need to ask at this point is, what exactly has Paul been doing for all those 14 years. We know he spent a lot of time in Roman Gentile Tarsus. He traveled back and forth to Jerusalem. But what exactly did Paul preach for all those 14 years? From his conversion in 34 AD to now in 48 AD. Now, the answer to that question is found in the, in the book of Galatians. Paul spells it out clearly for us in Galatians 1, in verse 15. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb, and called me by His grace. Now, we talked about this verse in a prior study. Paul says, God separated him from his mother's womb. The mother here is not his literal physical mother. Paul's speaking about Judaism. The Jews commonly refer to Israel as being their mother, the woman, Jerusalem. So what year did God separate Paul from his mother's womb? Well, that was the year 34 AD on the road to Damascus. And Jesus tells Paul in the next verse exactly what Paul's going to be doing for the rest of his life. Verse 16, to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen. Immediately I confer not with flesh and blood, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him fifteen days. And at this point, we know Paul fled Jerusalem and headed to his birthplace, Roman Tarsus, a city filled with Gentile heathens. Paul stays there for about 10 years until Barnabas comes to get him later on. So we see about 14 years go by in Paul's ministry. But what exactly did Paul preach during that time? And who did Paul preach to? Well, the answer is found again in Galatians, Galatians 2, chapter 2, verse 1. Then 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, and took Titus with me also. And I went up by revelation, and communed, com communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. So we see here that Paul's been preaching the revelation of the mystery, this new gospel revealed to him by Jesus Christ. He's been preaching to the Gentiles for those 14 years, from his conversion to Acts chapter 13. Paul's been preaching the gospel of grace to both Jews and 
Gentiles. If you want to get a good idea of what Paul's early ministry looks like, read the book of Galatians, especially chapter 1, 2, and 3. So now we're here, 14 years later, in 48 AD, and Paul is about to go on his first big journey to track down all the scattered Jews still under the kingdom program and to preach the gospel of grace to them and also to the Gentiles all at the same time from city to city. You'll notice that Paul has a plan of attack, if you will. He has a system that he uses in each city to add more and more Jews and Gentiles to the body of Christ. The first thing Paul does when he enters a new city is he finds the synagogues. Wherever there's a synagogue, there has to be his brethren, the Jews, both believing in and also unbelieving. And all are still heavily dominated by the Mosaic law system, temple worship, sacrifices, all those things. Second, Paul preaches to the Jews and proselytes and Gentiles in each of those synagogues. His first focus is to get the Jews' attention. He directs his message to them for the most part. And there's these Gentiles that hear Paul's message during that time, almost by default, if you will. The Jews don't like the fact that Gentiles are being saved, they're made jealous. And this causes problems for Paul. He never stays in one place too long. He's always on the go. And we find him in another city doing the same thing. He finds the Jews, goes to the synagogues, he preaches to them, and at the same time the Gentiles are hearing him preach, and he's turning to the Gentiles. Then he moves on to another city. So now we turn to chapter 13 in our study in Acts. Acts 13 Verse 1, Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Menaean, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. Now we see Paul's first journey. Looking at the map in front of you on the screen, we see Antioch. Then Paul and Barnabas traveled to the uh, west, a short distance to the port city of Seleucia. And once they find a boat in Seleucia, they set sail for Cyprus this island over here to the left and we're still in the year 48 AD in verse 4 so they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost departed unto Seleucia and from thence they sailed to this island Cyprus and when they were at Salamis they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews and they had also John to their minister and when they had gone through the Isle of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus. Take note, the entire island is called Cyprus. First, they dock at Salamis. Then, they end up on the other side of the island of Cyprus in a city called Paphos. And we continue on with Bar-Jesus, which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, who called for Barnabas and Saul, and desired to hear the word of God. But Elymas the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, this is Bar-Jesus, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him. Now the name Saul is Hebrew and the name Paul is Roman it's a Gentile name and it's commonly thought that Jesus changes Saul to Paul but he didn't do that like he changed Simon to Peter 
That's not the case with Paul. Jesus never changed Saul's name or Paul's name. Okay, so Paul sets his eyes on Bar Jesus, the sorcerer, and said, "Oh, full of all subtly and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord?" And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness. And he went about seeing, seeking some to lead him by the hand. Then the deputy, when he saw it was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Now when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia, straight to the north. And John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. So Paul then leaves this island of Cyprus, Paul and Barnabas, and sails up to Perga. And John does an about face and heads back to Jerusalem. Verse 14, But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia and went into the synagogues on the Sabbath day and sat down. Now it's important to note here that there's two Antiochs. There's one back east and there's one right here on the border of Galatia and Asia. And notice Paul is following his protocol here. First he finds the Jews, then he attends their synagogues, then he contends with them and reveals the gospel of grace this mystery Jesus revealed to him on the road to Damascus. Paul's about to speak to the Jews here and there's also Galatians there, there's Gentiles there, they're listening to what Paul has to say. This pattern is what Paul is going to use in every city that he goes to. In verse 15, And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue, sent it to them, saying, Ye men and brethren, He's speaking to Paul and Barnabas. If ye have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. Then Paul stood up, beckoning with his hand, said, Men of Israel, and ye that fear God. When he said men of Israel, he's speaking to the Jews. And when he says ye that fear God, he's speaking to the Gentiles. Give audience. The God of this people of Israel chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt. And with a high arm brought he them out of it. And about that time of forty years suffered he their manners in the wilderness. And when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he divided their land to them by lot. And after that he gave unto them judges about the space of four hundred and fifty years until Samuel the prophet and afterward they desired a king they were never happy these people and God gave unto them Saul the son of Sis a man of the tribe of Benjamin by the space of forty years and when he had removed him he raised up unto them David to be their king to whom also he gave their testimony and said I have found David the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Of this man's seed hath God, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a Savior, Jesus. When John had first preached before his coming the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel, and as John fulfilled his course, he said, Whom think ye that I am? I am not he, but behold, there cometh one after me, whose shoes of his feet I am not worthy to loose. Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you feareth God, to you is the word of the salvation sent. And notice here, Paul says, to you is this salvation sent. Jesus said, he came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel, not the Gentiles. Paul speaking directly to the Jews here. Paul's reminding the Jews 
what took place over 20 years ago when they killed Jesus. For they that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew him not, nor yet the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath day, they have fulfilled them in condemning him. And though they found no cause of death in him, yet desired they Pilate that he should be slain. And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher. Paul is preaching the death, burial, and resurrection. Verse 30, But God raised him from the dead, and he was seen many days of them, which came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses unto the people. Again, notice the difference between Paul's message and Peter's message. Peter would preach, believe, be baptized for the remission of sins, endure to the end. Paul is preaching something different. He's telling them about Jesus whom they killed, who was buried and rose again on the third day. You see, death, burial, resurrection. It's a complete different gospel. Again, verse 32, And we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now, no more to return to corruption. He said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Wherefore he said also in another psalm, Thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on, asleep, fell on sleep, and was laid unto his fathers, and saw corruption. But he whom God raised again, saw no corruption. Be it known unto you therefore men and brethren, Jews and Gentiles, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him all that believe are justified from all things, from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. Paul begins revealing this new dispensation of grace here. He's really digging into it. This new gospel, this mystery, salvation without the law. And here's where Paul's problems usually begin with the Jews. The Jews don't want to hear anything bad about keeping laws. Their mosaic protocol is deeply ingrained in their DNA. The law is all they've ever known throughout history. It's part of their genetics. Verse 40, Beware, therefore, lest that come upon you, which is spoken of in the prophets. Behold, ye despisers, and wonder, and perish, for I work a work in your days, a work which ye shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them, the next Sabbath. We can see here that the Gentiles also took part in these synagogue services. Many were proselytes. Many were there contemplating of becoming a proselyte, curious about Judaism perhaps. So while Paul is directing his thoughts to the Jews, the Gentiles are liking what Paul's telling them. Salvation without the law. Salvation without becoming a proselyte. The Gentiles don't have to submit to the authority of the Jews. And the Jews don't like that too much. You see, to the Jews, this means less control over the Gentiles. And less control always means less money to pillage. It's interesting, when you follow the money, you always get to the root of every situation. Even today, it's the same way. Verse 43, Now when the congregation was broken up, 
Many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. And the next Sabbath day came almost a whole city together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw this, the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. The Jews didn't like the fact that all these Gentiles were now getting God's attention. They became jealous. Look at the book of Romans real quick. Romans 11. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles. For to provoke them to jealousy. We see where this jealousy is coming from already in Paul's first journey. 46. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing ye put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed, and the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. But the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coasts. The Jews are now jealous. They're getting angry, angry enough to kill them. So Paul and Barnabas move on to a new city. Verse 51, But they shook off the dust of their feet against them and came unto Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. In our next study, in chapter 14, we're going to see Paul and Barnabas travel all throughout the Galatian area. I highly suggest for those of you who are appreciating the study and are really eager to grow spiritually for homework, read Galatians. It's all about this period of time that we're dealing with here in Paul's ministry. You'll have a better sense of what's taking place as we move on through chapter 14, 15, and 16, and so on. So looking at the map on the screen, They'll travel south from Antioch to Iconium to Lystra, then over to Derb. Then they do an about face and they make the same loop, uh, loop going backwards through the entire area. And lastly, there's a reason why God had Barnabas to travel alongside Paul. One, to open the door for Paul amongst the kingdom saints, especially in Cyprus where Barnabas was from. Barnabas knew everybody in Cyprus and it made it easier for Paul to get his foot in the door to preach this new gospel of one body made up of both Jews and Gentiles. The second reason was simply to be a added witness for Paul and third also for safety for protection and to confirm everything the Holy Spirit was doing through Paul. Paul had eyewitnesses of everything being done through his ministry. So that's it for this study. Until the next study, peace, grace, love of Christ Jesus be with all of you. Lord willing, I'll see you for chapter 14 in our study on the book of Acts.